Lord. Our first reading for this Sunday is taken from the book of Exodus. Let us reflect on love as the true orientation of the human heart. I know we are all looking for direction in life. There, are, there is a lot of confusion sometimes, you know? and there are a lot of things that go on in our minds and our hearts. Where should we really go? Let us listen to the deepest longings of our heart. That is love. In the first reading, we hear some very, very interesting and impressive commandments from God. And they are commandments of God pertaining to our relationship with neighbors. So we see here in Exodus how God wants us to be oriented towards our neighbors in love. The real way of dealing with our neighbors, pleasing to God, is love. But first is, who is the neighbor? <laughs> who is the neighbor? Whom do you consider your neighbor? In the first reading, the following are presented as neighbors. First, the aliens. If you are a Jewish person, this will come to you as a surprise. For they were used to thinking of neighbors only within the confines of the chosen people. If you belong to the chosen people of God, there is no doubt you are a neighbor. But the alien is presented by God to the Israelites as a neighbor. You should not oppress. You should not molest the foreigner. Why? Because you were foreigners before. You were aliens once in Egypt. So in every foreigner, see yourself. Remember your own history. They are no different from you. They bear your identity too. The next, the widows, the orphans, the helpless people who are prone to manipulation. They are not objects. To be manipulated they are your neighbors and if you hurt them their cry will reach the heavens and God will take their side God promises that and if you are unkind to the widows and the orphans look at what is promised your wives will also end up being widows and your children will end up being orphans wow look at the similarity of my children and these orphans. I should look at every orphan as my child too. I should look at every widow as someone who I should care for the way I care for my wife. And the third, the poor. The poor who borrow money. The poor who have, uh, uh, who have nothing. To live on and so they they they, they uh, beg and usually they give you or lend to you their cloak as a pledge as a collateral now fair enough but god tells the israelites before sundown return the cloak for this poor person, even if he has not paid everything, return the cloak, for the night will come. And uh, this poor person needs covering from the winds, the cold. And do not exact interest. Do not be manipulative. Do not be usurious towards the poor and the helpless. This is the will of God that these people who are considered outsiders should be seen as neighbors. And you should love them. They should remind us of our own destiny and of our own past. They are no different from us. We should see ourselves in them. Lord, 
Our second reading for this Sunday is taken from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. We have been reflecting on love as the true direction and orientation of the human heart. That is the fulfillment of the longings of our human heart. In the first reading from Exodus, we see God communicating to His people the commandment of love in very concrete terms. Loving the neighbor. But who is the neighbor? Loving the alien. Loving the widows. Loving the orphans. Loving the poor who have nothing. In a way, these ones could easily be considered as outsiders. They did not belong to the chosen people. But every Israelite should see in them, should see in them themselves. They are the bearers of the face of every person who belongs to God's chosen people. And so they must love them, love them fully, truly. In the second reading, St. Paul can become a model to us of love. And now we see love as the orientation of St. Paul as a missionary and as a human person. But look at how this love is manifested. First, no one, after reading this passage from his first letter to the Thessalonians, could doubt the deep love of St. Paul for the Thessalonians. Hearing good news about them, he writes to them. And what affection! And the affection that St. Paul has for them is not just on the human plane. And this is important, my dear brothers and sisters, to note. His love for the Thessalonians reaches the level of faith. His love is motivated by faith. And he loves them. How does he manifest his love for the Thessalonians? By caring for them spiritually. This is an important aspect of loving. While feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, etc., are all part of God's command. We should not forget there are also spiritual actions that are acts of love, acts of mercy, and to provide spiritual care to people is one of the greatest acts of love we can render to them. In fact, Pope Francis once said in a homily that uh, one great injustice in the world right now is the lack of pastoral and spiritual loving or care being given to the poor. Yeah, to care for people spiritually, to nurture their faith, to lead them to God is an act of love. And St. Paul in the second reading shows that. Read the second reading carefully and you could see the heart of St. Paul loving them. And his desire is for the Thessalonians to become closer to God and to know God faithfully. But we also see another aspect of the love of St. Paul. While solicitous for the Thessalonians, you could see how much St. Paul loved God too. He was willing to offer his whole life so that the gospel of Jesus could be preached. He was willing to undergo all suffering for the gospel for the service of God. In the second reading, we have in the person of St. Paul what we have been developing as a theme. The direction of one's life is love. And in St. Paul, two loves come together. 
love of God, and love of neighbor. For love to unite and integrate my life, it must be total. It must be directed to both God and neighbor. Then, your life has one direction. Our Gospel passage for this Sunday is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew. We have been reflecting on love as the real direction and orientation of human life. We find the fulfillment of our lives in love. In the first reading from Exodus, God commands the Israelites to love their neighbor, surprising neighbors, the alien, the outsider, the widows, the orphans, and the poor. These people should not be considered as other in the sense that we have nothing in common. No, God tells the Israelites, these people should remind you of who you are. You should see your past in them. You should see your longings in them. And so love them. And the love of neighbor is a desire of God. It is a commandment of God. It is not something that comes out of the blues. It is God who tells the Israelites, this is how you should love your neighbor. In the second reading, St. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, exudes love for the neighbor, in this case, the Thessalonians. But in one important area, he manifests his love for the Thessalonians in the area of their faith life, which we should not neglect. While the corporal acts of love will remain necessary and indispensable, we should not forget to care for the spiritual needs of people. That is an important aspect of loving our neighbors. But in St. Paul, we see the motivation too. He loves the Thessalonians with his love for God. It is his passion for Jesus, his passion for the gospel that impels him in a way to love the Thessalonians more. So, the direction, the orientation of the life of the Apostle Paul is manifested in the coming together of two loves, love of God and love of neighbor. In the gospel, this becomes clearer, coming from Jesus himself. Unfortunately, just like the past Sundays, our gospel passage begins with a rather bad intention on the part of the Pharisees. Uh, they would want to trap Jesus again, and this time through an expert in the law, a lawyer, Ma. <laughs> if a lawyer asks you about the law, well, you can be a uh, trip. You can be trapped, and you can, can you can not trip. You can make a fool of yourself. Oh. <laughs> when will we find love for Jesus among these people, like the religious leaders? And the question was tricky. Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? If you were Jesus, you would really uh, get confused. Remember that during the time of Christ, in the Hebrew scriptures and with the commentaries coming from the leaders or the teachers, they, according to experts, they were able to count they say around 613 commandments, precepts, and prohibitions. Now, if you are asked of this more than 600 commandments that comprise the law, 
which is the greatest. I would not know how to choose among the more than 600. Maybe I would engage in a, some sort of a, an elimination process. Yes, there are more than 600, but let me concentrate on the Ten Commandments, knowing that there are other commandments and precepts. Yes, that could have been done by Jesus. But Jesus, who claims that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill the law, knows what the commandment is all about. You may have 600, 700, 1,000 commandments, but Jesus knows what all the commandments are all about. Commandments coming from God are not just prohibitions. They are really God's way of orienting the human heart. Let us admit, brothers and sisters, the human heart has so many desires. And some of our desires are conflicting. We don't even understand how some of those desires are present in our hearts. We have so many plans, but uh, we know that those plans don't always agree with one another. We have so many desires, so many plans, so many dreams, etc. How do we put order in all of them? How do we find the real direction that our hearts are looking for? That's the purpose of the commandments from God. They are not really just prohibitions. The prohibitions and the positive prescriptions are a way of orienting our hearts towards the real goal. So let us not look at commandments negatively. They are a help to our broken and even confused hearts. Knowing that the commandment is all about that. Allowing human beings to reach their real destination and purpose in life. Jesus was able to go through all those more than 600 precepts and find the core. The first he quotes from Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, and with all your mind. You shall love your God. You are not being told to love an idea, someone unknown. You love your God, the God who liberated you, the God who created you, the God who said, I am your God. And you are my people. The God who is with you and for you and in, in you. And love is the orientation. You love God with your whole heart. The heart here is the center of sentiments, plans, and thoughts. The soul. The soul is the center of life and the, and the willingness to live. The mind, the mind is not just one faculty. It is a symbol of the capacity of the human person to reach beyond itself. So, Jesus is telling this uh, lawyer, one orientation of the commandment is for you to live the totality of your life for God, for God, in love. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You should be oriented also towards your neighbor in love. And the norm is what you will do for yourself, you should be ready to do for your neighbor because your neighbor is your own. See yourself. In it. And so Jesus brings these two commandments, one from Deuteronomy, one from Leviticus. And by bringing them together, he is telling us the orientation of your life, the direction of your life 
is in love. But it must be total. The, the whole of you and directed to everyone, God and neighbor. Oh, it simplifies life. It simplifies life. And this commandment, if heeded, will not only purify us, it will lead us to true joy. It will lead us to the true direction that God intended for us. It will lead us to the fulfillment of the longings of our hearts. In the Philippines, we are celebrating this Sunday, Prison Awareness Sunday. I love visiting our brothers and sisters who are in prison. I was asked once why I've been doing it, visiting and uh, celebrating Mass there. And without uh, much reflection, I told the person interviewing me, whenever I go to the prison cells, I am reminded of who I am. And the interviewer was quite surprised. How is that possible, your eminence? said, because I see in them myself. They're not the only sinners. I am one of them. And coming to them is a reminder that I belong to a community where we all need God's mercy, God's compassion, God's love. Coming to them, I see myself. And I hope coming to them, I bring the love of God. The love of God that embraces all of us. And so as brothers and sisters, we know we have one direction, God. If you have time this Sunday and these coming days, visit one of our brothers and sisters. See yourself in them. And with them, pray to the merciful God, the God who does not tire of loving us. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it.